The Empire Strikes Back is considered one of the greatest sequels of all time, containing one of the most shocking plot twists of all time. However, we almost got a very different movie that not only wouldn't have included that iconic twist, but would have instead had the Force Ghost of Anakin Skywalker actually meet Luke. Additionally, the film would have introduced Vader's lava castle, as well as revealed that Lando is actually a clone, having survived the Clone Wars. So let's dive in and find out why the film was changed and what could have been The Empire Strikes Back. Before we dive in, a quick shout out to this video sponsor, Onasaber.com. Throughout March 2024, get a free scabbard with any lightsaber purchase from Onasaber's incredible collection. Simply add both the lightsaber of your choice and a scabbard to your cart, and the scabbard will automatically be free at checkout, compliments of Onasaber. And if a scabbard isn't your thing, use our special Bullets and Blockbusters promo code linked in the description below to slash 20% off your order on eligible items. Also, be sure to check out all of the cool additions that Onus Saber have added to their store like the Staff Bundles and Scrapyard Collection for unique finds that'll make you the envy of the galaxy. Again, just follow the link in the description below to light up your life with OnusSaber.com and may the Force be with you. While Lucas was busy directing Episode 4, he hired writer Alan Dean Foster to pen the novelization of the movie. However, Foster's contract also required him to write a second novel. So when he handed in his novelization of episode 4 during that film's tumultuous production, Lucas asked him to write a more modest follow-up that Lucas could then adapt into a low-budget sequel film in case Star Wars was not successful enough to warn a larger, bigger budget sequel. To keep the budget down, Foster set the majority of the story on the planet of Mimban, which Luke, Leia, and the two droids crash land on due to an energy storm they encounter in space, en route to persuade the planet of Sir Carpus IV to join the Rebel Alliance. Once on Mimban, they learn of the kyber crystal from an older Force-sensitive woman, who strikes a deal with Luke and Leia to help them get them off the planet in exchange for their assistance in locating the crystal, which greatly enhances Force abilities. Together, they navigate Mimban's many dangers to find the Temple of Pomajima, where the kyber crystal is rumored to be. Once there, they meet Vader, also in pursuit of the crystal. After Luke gets pinned under a boulder after attempting to fend off a monster, Leia takes Luke's lightsaber and tries to fight off Vader, who injures her before Luke is able to recover and take over, eventually slicing off Vader's arm as the duel ends with Vader falling into a pit. Luke uses the crystal to heal Leia before the two escape into the mists of Mimban. And while Foster would be given a lot of creative freedom to write the story, Lucas would give him a few restrictions. Originally, the story opened with a space battle, which is what forces Luke and Leia to crash land on Mimban. However, Lucas forced Foster to cut this out, as he worried it would be too expensive to film on a small budget. The other restriction, which you've probably already noticed, is that the story couldn't include Han Solo, as Harrison Ford hadn't yet committed to starring in any Star Wars sequels, unlike his two co-stars who had. And since there would be no Han, Foster figured there shouldn't be any Chewie either. The book would eventually be called Splinter of the Mind's Eye, but by the time it was published, Star Wars had broken box office records, leading Lucas to abandon plans to adapt Mind's Eye into a film, as the novel would instead become the first in a long line of Star Wars books that would form the now non-canonical expanded universe. However, Lucas came very close to abandoning Star Wars altogether. While directing the first film, he dealt with a difficult crew, a cinematographer who wouldn't follow his direction, the droids constantly breaking down, and he had to build a visual effects company from scratch, which at one point was in total disarray after spending half its budget with nothing to show for it. Moreover, the relentless pressure to complete what was an incredibly ambitious film on time and for a limited budget further exasperated Lucas' stress, resulting in him ending up in the hospital with chest pains. And while the film ended up being a massive hit, surpassing even his wildest expectations, unfortunately he wasn't satisfied with the end result. In fact, he was somewhat embarrassed by it, feeling it was only about 25% of what he wanted it to be, which is one of the reasons he made changes to it years later later for the special editions. As a result, for the sequel, Lucas considered selling the whole thing to Fox, like he'd do with Disney years later, and just have Fox do it. However, he became captivated with finishing the story, and couldn't stand the thought of someone else doing it wrong, especially considering he had already mapped out parts of it. And since Lucas was now not only rich, but had retained the sequel rights to the film, he realized that this time around he could make the film the way he wanted, as long as he financed it himself. And that's exactly what he did, as he'd make a deal with Fox to distribute the film while giving them no creative input. To write it, Lucas turned to science fiction writer Lee Brackett, who is renowned for her quick-paced dialogue, an area Lucas famously struggled with. You can type this stuff, stuff <laughs> but you can't say it. 
Brackett had also contributed to screenplays like The Big Sleep for director Howard Hawks, as well as Rio Bravo for John Wayne. Together, Brackett and Lucas held several story conferences where Lucas shared his ideas for the sequel, resulting in the writing of a treatment that Brackett would use to form the basis of her script. After she wrote it and then handed it in, however, Lucas was unable to reach her in order to share his notes, as he would eventually learn that she had been hospitalized, sadly passing away from cancer a few weeks later. And while the spine of Brackett's script largely resembled the finished film, there are major key differences. Let's start with Hoth, which is just called the Ice Planet here. In the original version, Ben doesn't appear as a Force ghost to instruct Luke to go to Dagobah to be trained by Yoda. Instead, Luke accidentally discovers a crystal in his lightsaber hilt that resembles a memory cell, which he speculates may hold coordinates to the place where his father was trained. And Luke is driven to get more training because in this version it's painfully obvious that he desperately needs it. When the Rebel base, here described as an ice castle, is invaded by ice monsters, aka Wampas, Luke attempts to fight them off, but gets humiliated as he gets his ass handed to him, leading Han to tell him that he's not a Jedi Knight and never will be. And while we're talking about Han, Leia asks him to travel to meet with his stepfather, Ovan Marikal, to try and convince him to join the Rebellion, saying that he's the most powerful man in the galaxy next to the Emperor as he runs a transport guild, and if he joins the Rebels, so too will all the pilots and navigators in the commercial space throughout the galaxy. The Empire also doesn't send out probe droids in this version. Instead, on the planet of Ton Mund, which would eventually become Coruscant, Vader interrogates a traitor and learns the location of the Rebel base. As a side note, Vader's dialogue throughout the script is really out of character for him. For example, when interrogating the traitor, he loudly demands, the coordinates man, the coordinates. It seems Brackett really didn't have a handle on how to write for the character. However, this version of the film continues to develop the love triangle between Luke, Han, and Leia that was set up in the first film, with both men vying for her affection as she makes out with both of them throughout the script, with Luke even professing his love for her. Unfortunately, the love triangle feels like it's out of a film from a bygone era, possibly influenced by Brackett's history of adapting Raymond Chandler novels for the big screen. Leia eventually confesses to Han while they're invading the Empire in the Falcon that he's the one she wants. However, before that, Luke feels the Empire approach the Rebel base, which already has its hands full with the ice monsters. Eventually, just like in the finished film, Luke and R2 leave separately from Han and Leia. However, Vader is able to use the Force to form a mental connection with Luke, choking him unconscious while he's piloting his escape, with Vader believing he's killed him. However, R2 takes over piloting the ship and charts a course to the coordinates from the lightsaber crystal as he and Luke jump to hyperspace and escape. R2 eventually crash lands on the Bog Planet, which was called Mimban in Splinter of the Mind's Eye, and was one of Lucas' original ideas in his earliest Episode 4 script. Eventually, Lucas would rename this planet to Dagobah, and Mimban would end up appearing in Han Solo's standalone film. After Luke wakes up, he meets Yoda, here a frog-like alien named Minch, and Lucas created this character because he killed off Obi-Wan in Episode 4, something he didn't initially plan to do. But after realizing that Obi-Wan mostly just stood around with nothing to do during the Death Star run, Lucas decided to kill him off, which also added drama to the film, but left Luke without a mentor for the second film. Thus, Lucas created Minch, aka Yoda. To set him apart from Obi-Wan, Lucas made him small and unassuming, and also hundreds of years old. It's important to also note that Minch doesn't speak in his famous inverted sentence structure in Brackett's draft. That would be a Lucas edition that would come later, which Lucas added because he felt that all of Yoda's philosophical dialogue in Brackett's draft was somewhat boring and cliche. But by making Yoda speak backwards, it would set him apart from Obi-Wan and make him seem more alien and also compelling, as he had to really pay attention to what he was saying. Minch eventually summons Ben's force ghost as the two have a playful duel that sees Minch get the better of him, as Ben reveals that Minch was his teacher. Eventually, after much training with Minch, Luke learns how to summon Ben himself, who appears before him and introduces Luke to his father, now a force ghost like Ben. Luke's father informs him that he has a sister and separated them when they were young to hide them from the Empire. When Luke asks him her name, his dad refuses to tell him, worried that Vader could extract the information from his mind. The scene ends with Minch, Ben, and Luke's father knighting Luke with their lightsabers, making him a Jedi Knight. Lucas would eventually nix this scene completely from the finished film, but leave a small trace of it when Luke is taking off in his X-Wing on Dagobah to go save his friends. Worried, Obi-Wan tells Yoda that Luke is their last hope, but Yoda corrects him, saying that there's another. That other Yoda is talking about was originally supposed to be Luke's twin sister on the other side of the galaxy, who Lucas planned to introduce in her own solo film before teaming her up with Luke to take down the Emperor. This plan would eventually be scrapped in favor of wrapping up the series with Return of the Jedi, as Leia would be made to be the other Yoda was referring to, with Lucas retconning her into being Luke's sister. The idea of Luke having a long-lost sister was also revealed to Mark Hamill when he asked Lucas if he would have been recast if he died in the car accident that badly injured his face. For those unaware, Hamill
Hamill fractured his nose and cheekbone in a car crash while on his way to shoot final pickup shots for episode 4, forcing a plastic surgeon to take cartilage from his ear in order to rebuild his nose, forever changing his face. To explain why he looked different in Empire, Lucas wrote in the Wampa attack at the start of the film and told Hamill that if he died, he wouldn't have recast him, but introduced a long-lost Force-sensitive sibling instead. In respect to the scene in the original script with Anakin's Force ghost, it's worth pointing out that Lucas kept the true identity of Vader pretty close to his chest, and never told Brackett his plans. So if she had lived to write the second draft of the script, it's likely the scene with Luke meeting a Force ghost of his father would have been cut anyway. Lucas not only withheld the revelation of Vader being Luke's father from Lee Brackett, but he also kept the secret from David Prowse, the actor who portrayed Vader. Prowse had a reputation for leaking plot secrets at conventions, so to counter this, Lucas began giving Prowse dummy scripts, leading him to say lines that weren't really in the movie. Even the famous reveal where he tells Luke he's his father was said differently by Prowse on set, with Vader claiming that Obi-Wan killed Luke's father, which upset Prowse when he eventually saw the finished film, as he complained that he would have delivered the line differently with his body language had he known. Vader's lava castle also would have been introduced in this version of the film, which is where Vader lives with his pet gargoyles. While here, he would have formed another mental connection with Luke as he learns that he's still alive. These force bonds continue to happen throughout the story and are similar to what we'd eventually see between Kylo Ren and Rey in The Last Jedi. From here, Vader would have FaceTimed the Emperor with the news, who instructs Vader to kill Luke once and for all, or he'll kill Vader. However, Vader has other plans and wants Luke to join him to rule together and bring peace back to the galaxy, doing away with the Emperor. Unlike in the finished film where Luke leaves Dagobah against Yoda's wishes and with his training incomplete, here he leaves a Jedi Knight and makes his way to Cloud City, here called Orbital City, as he senses Leia's in danger. There are several differences once Han, Leia, Chewie, and 3PO arrive at Orbital City, which hovers in the clouds above a ruined city where tall, ethereal, milky white skinned aliens live and ride on flying mantas similar to Avatar. These are the cloud people, and Lucas would repurpose them for Attack of the Clones as the people who live on Kamino. Lando's last name is Kadar in this version and not Calrissian, as he reveals to Leia that he's a clone of the Ashardi family, but since the wars, there are not many of his kind left. Remarking solemnly, it didn't seem strange to us to see our own faces endlessly repeated in the streets of our cities. It gave us a sense of oneness, of belonging. Now, when every face is new and different, I feel truly alone. Just like in the finished film, Lando betrays Han. But there's no torture scene, no bounty hunters, and Han is never frozen in carbonite. Instead, everyone's allowed to go about their business, but aren't allowed to leave, which seriously lacks tension compared to the final version of the film. When Luke finally arrives, he goes to the Cloud People for help, who give him a flying manta to ride as he sneaks into Orbital City, before confronting Vader. In this version, Luke channels the dark side to help him in his duel with Vader, but obviously there's no I am your father moment, and Luke doesn't lose his hand. Eventually, Luke falls over a railing, but is saved by the Falcon as everyone escapes, similar to the finished film. Film. The movie ends with Luke and Leia wishing good luck to Han as he leaves with Chewie to find a stepfather and convince him to join the rebellion. Unfortunately, when Lucas read Brackett's script, he didn't like it, although in her defense, it was a first draft, with Lucas even admitting that his ideas during their story conferences weren't fully formed before she went off to write it. Still, it does hit many of the same beats as the final film while retaining the same story structure, but lacking many of the elements that made Empire so iconic. With Brackett in the hospital, Lucas had no choice but to write the second draft himself, introducing Using things like Yoda's unique backwards way of speaking, as well as the character of Boba Fett, inspired by the man with no name from Sergio Leone's Dollars trilogy, hence why he wears a poncho. Lucas also wanted to end the film on a cliffhanger in an effort to mirror the movie serials he watched as a kid, which often left audiences waiting eagerly for the next chapter. The film's cliffhanger would be heightened by Harrison Ford only signing on for one sequel, leaving his status for a third film in limbo, which is why he's put in Carbonite, whereas Hamill and Fisher had signed on not only for Empire and a third film film, but a fourth one too. After writer Lawrence Kasdan turned in his draft of Raiders of the Lost Ark, Lucas asked him if he would do a rewrite of Lucas's recent draft of Empire, prompting Kasdan to ask Lucas, don't you want to read Raiders first to see if you like it? To which Lucas jokingly replied, if I hate Raiders, I'll rescind the offer. From here, both Lucas, Kasdan, and director Irvin Kirshner held several story conferences to further develop the script, with both men also challenging Lucas when his ideas didn't work or made little sense, which Lucas was receptive to, although he did the same when he didn't like their ideas. Lucas also had other ideas for Empire that never made it into the final script, but would be used in later films such as a water planet with an underwater city, which we'd see in the form of Kamino and Naboo respectively, a city planet which would become Coruscant, and Force Lightning, which Lucas originally wanted Vader to use in his duel against Luke. And since directing the first Star Wars film nearly killed him, when it was time to do the second one, Lucas wanted to hire someone else to sit in the director's chair, while 
while he oversaw rebuilding ILM, which had been virtually disbanded since the previous film, and Skywalker Sound. And that someone, as just mentioned, was Irvin Kirshner, an older but fellow USC alum who Lucas had met while he was still a student there. In fact, not only would Kirshner return occasionally to teach at USC, but he was one of the judges at the 1968 National Student Film Festival, in which Lucas' short film, THX 1138, won the top prize. As director of Empire, Kirshner was extremely enthusiastic and constantly looking for ways to improve the picture, which meant he was often coming up with new ideas and making last-minute adjustments that would slow things down. And when he was pressured to speed things up, that would apparently slow him down even more, resulting in the shoot falling behind schedule. Kirshner would be further delayed by frequent technical problems such as special effects or the robots not functioning, or sets being very difficult to work in, like the carbon freezing chamber. Complicating matters was the fact that Empire was fighting for soundstage space with Stanley Kubrick's The Shining at L Street Studios, which saw Stage 3 burn down right before Empire was to begin shooting, forcing them to shoot the film on one less stage, screwing up their schedule and delaying them further. In charge of this mess was producer Gary Kurtz, who Lucas was initially reluctant to rehire after being unhappy with how Kurtz handled some issues while producing Episode 4. However, Kurtz fought for the job, arguing that he had worked with Lucas since American Graffiti, was loyal, and knew Star Wars. Against his better judgment, Lucas hired him to produce Empire, a decision he would come to regret, as Kurtz was unable to speed up his slow-moving director. In fact, he hardly had a relationship with Kirshner at all. Under Kurtz, Empire would find itself well over schedule and budget, to the point where they were unable to make a $1 million payroll one week unless they went to the bank and asked for more money, which they did, but the bank refused. In need of $5 million to finish the picture and to meet that Friday's payroll, Lucas had two options. A, go crawling back to Fox and hand over the rights to the film in exchange for more money, or B, find another bank. To Lucas's horror, once Fox got wind of this, they began threatening to call in a completion bond and take the film away from Lucas. Luckily for Lucas, eventually he was able to secure the additional funds by refinancing the movie with the First Bank of Boston, while also getting a little more money from Fox, in return for giving Fox a larger share of the profits, with Lucas ultimately retaining the rights to his creation. Still, it was an incredibly tense situation, as Lucas came very close to losing the rights to Star Wars, which he had worked so hard to get. Not only that, but he had to keep this situation from the cast and crew in order to keep the production moving so it wouldn't fall further behind schedule. And while Kurtz would argue that going over budget was worth it, as the film was even better than the first one, and that the sequel to Star Wars was going to be a big hit no matter what, that's easy for Kurtz to say when it's not his money on the line, as Lucas had invested his entire fortune into Empire and bet the farm on it. If Empire had failed, not only would it ruin Lucas financially, but he'd lose his independence from the studio system, which is exactly what would end up happening to his buddy Francis Ford Coppola a couple of years later with One from the Heart. Ultimately, Kurtz would not be asked back for Return of the Jedi. Fortunately, Empire would be a massive success, and since it ended on a cliffhanger, it left audiences hotly anticipating the next one, which Lucas promised would conclude this trilogy, while teasing two more, saying, The prequel stories exist, where Darth Vader came from, and the whole story about Darth and Ben Kenobi, and it all takes place before Luke is born. The other trilogy, what happens to Luke afterward, is much more ethereal. I have a tiny notebook full of notes on that. Sadly, we'd never get to see what Lucas would have done had he directed the sequels, as he'd end up selling Star Wars to Disney like he almost sold it to Fox before making Empire, which likely would have robbed us of one of the greatest sequels of all time, and forever changed Star Wars as we know it. Thanks for watching everybody, and don't forget to like and subscribe to Bullets and Blockbusters for more great content.